Today on The Girl Defined Show, we are going to have a super down-to-earth, fun, casual, chill conversation all about the topic of motherhood. Many of you guys know that Zach and I adopted our boys a little over two years ago now, which is crazy, Um, but they're bigger boys. They're 13 and 9, and so motherhood has looked very different for me. And I just want to share with you guys what it looks like, what our daily routines look like, how we navigate things like discipleship and discipline, um, how we do school, how we... Um, talk about life, how we strive to be intentional to teach our boys about God and what it looks like to walk in his ways. You know, it's so funny because I'm, you know, girl defined has been my passion, helping women, young women. And now here I have these two boys that I'm raising. So it's been like such a shift, but it's been awesome. So let's just dive in all things motherhood today here on the Girl Defined Show. Hey, sisterhood, it's Kristen here, and I'm so glad you're sticking around for this conversation. I had this idea, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to jump on. This is very impromptu. I have like a few bullet points, so I just, you know, don't get too much off on some random rabbit trail, and then 30 minutes later, you're like, what are we even talking about? (laughs) But I haven't really shared an update with you guys in a while or talked specifically about motherhood and what it looks like for me. And my experiences, the journey, um, the highs, the lows, the in-betweens, and then just digging into some of the practical things, the things that I've learned from other moms that have been hugely helpful, even just in the past two years in raising my boys, discipling my boys, loving my boys, um, all those things. And then of course, there's still so many more things I have to learn. I I see other moms sometimes and like you, and it's like, I have such a long way to go, but God's grace is sufficient. He is good. He is faithful. And he's not looking for perfection. He knows we're not perfect. That's why he gave us Jesus. But just that daily dependence upon the Lord is something that I'm also striving in and continuing to grow in. So diving right in, motherhood has been awesome. Like I said in the intro, our boys are 13 and 9. So I have a teenager. Y'all, I have a teenager. What in the world? He just turned 13 a couple of months ago. And that was wild for me because many of you know my journey to become a mom was hard. It was 10 years of infertility, of recurrent miscarriage, of things not working out the way I'd hoped, the way I'd planned. In fact, I write all about that in the book I authored with Bethany, not part of the plan, trusting God with the twists and turns of your story. So just quick plug, if you're in a season of unfulfilled longings um, in any capacity, whether it's children, um, marriage, something else, a job, friendships, then not part of the plan will be a huge, huge encouragement to you. We get super raw, super down to earth, real in that book. But anyways, my journey to motherhood was not what I always imagined it would be. And then God opened the door for adoption a couple years ago and did a 180 in my heart. I wasn't really open to adoption before. Um, There was just a lot of things about it that were unknown, kind of foreign, kind of scary to me. But God did a 180 in my heart and just helped me see the beauty, um, the, the parallels of the gospel and earthly adoption. And it's just like my heart exploded and I was 100% on board and God led us to Ukraine and now we have our two boys. And so I became an instant mom of two boys. And at the time when we adopted them, they were 10 and six. They could not speak any English, zero English. And they could speak Russian and Ukrainian. And Zach and I were trying to learn a little bit of those languages so we could communicate. Um, Thankfully, Google Translate came in really clutch. Um, but it was just an interesting start, you know, not your typical way that most of you, um, who are moms have become moms or those of you who will become moms one day. It's not the most traditional path to motherhood, but one that I'm so grateful for and that I wouldn't change for the world. So to give you guys just kind of a, a snapshot of what a day looks like for us, how I strive to be intentional, how I've taken on some of the things that I've seen from other godly moms and tried to implement them into my discipleship with the boys. Um, I am, I say I'm a stay at home mom. I really am. I homeschool the boys. I mean, we are together all the time, but then I also work part-time. I do girl Define, podcasting, writing books, um, things, you know, on social media, stuff like that. And then of course, just involved in so many things in my church, all of that. So I have my hand in a lot of different places, but I love it. And the boys truly have become my priority. They are my children. I love them to death. I want to be there for them. I want to be available, present. I want to have opportunities to invest, to disciple, to disciple, to train. Um, So it's just been a huge transition, but really sweet. 
currently they are at a co-op. So we homeschool and then one day a week they do go to a co-op for maybe like six or seven hours. So that's where they're there right now. So I'm able to easily record this and just have this fun conversation with you guys. Um, but one of the things that I've seen a lot of other families do that I found, found to be so helpful, not only personally, but in showing our boys from the beginning that God is the most important, that he is the one that we need. <laughs> oh, I need him so desperately. My boys, they can see that every day. But we want to remind all of us, including our boys, that we need God and that we want to seek him. You know, we want our hearts to be set on him at the beginning of each day. And so something that we started doing right after we brought them here to America and started developing some of our routines and rhythms as a family is we start every single morning with a family devotional time. And this usually looks like all of us together, or sometimes Zach will have to leave for work early. So I just do it with the boys, but we sit down and we all get our Bibles out. So we bought them Bibles right away. They couldn't read English. Obviously we got them picture Bibles so they could follow along and understand and kind of, you know, engage. Um, but we all sit down with our Bibles and then for like five to 10 minutes, we actually each just kind of engage in our own Bible. And the reason we did this instead of just doing it all together only is because we wanted to train them that it's important to learn God's word for yourself. It's important to to take an interest in God's word and not just be a passive recipient, kind of like forced to hear something, but to actually kind of take ownership. Like, yeah, God cares about you. You, you know, he loves you. Like you can discover who he is on your own. You don't have to have your parents, although we play a huge role in that. So from the beginning, we gave them each their own Bibles. We all sit down and for like five to 10 minutes, like I said, we all just look at our own Bibles. You know, at the beginning, they would just look at the pictures and they loved it. Like they thought this was awesome and they loved learning about God. And I would just read my own Bible. And then now that they can read, they have their own Bibles. They call it their big boy Bibles with actual like the Bible, you know, like actual text, not just pictures. And we sit there and we do the same thing now. And it's just so sweet. And they wake up, they know it's the routine. They look forward to it. They don't, they don't push back against it. They're excited. They know they're like, wow, they want to know more about God. It's just really sweet to see their eager hearts. So we do that for five to 10 minutes. And then we do transition to having some Bible time together. So at that point, I will read a devotional. Like there's so many different devotional books that we've gone through. Just really great gospel-centered books um, for kids that are Bible-based devotional. So they're learning about the word of God. They're learning about God's character. We've done so many over the past two years because we do it every day. So we fly through them, but they love that time. And we sit we read it all together and then we talk about it and we try, you know, I try to pull out one or two things that we can apply for that day. Um, don't want to overwhelm them. You know, we're not trying to cover everything all at once, but just one or two things. And then we stop and we all pray. And I, I love this, you know, as soon as they could start speaking English, they wanted to pray. They were interested in engaging. So for them, this has been normal. It's been part of our family routine from the beginning, but we all pray from, you know, the youngest to the two boys. And then I pray or Zach will pray. And we all just ask God to help us with that thing we learned about, or we praise him for a, an attribute or something about his character that we learned in that devotional. And then we ask him for help for the day, you know, for specific things that we each struggle with. We all know each other's struggles and we all, we pray for those things and we pray for one another and we pray for, you know, all sorts of things. And just hearing the prayers of the boys, like it almost brings me to tears sometimes just hearing them talk to God and pour their heart out to God. And for this to be such a natural habit for them, something that is just like, this is what we do. We seek the Lord, we praise him and we pray to him. And it's something that is just, it's just what believers do and they love it. And it's been such a sweet routine. So I just want to encourage you, if you have little kids, even if they're really small, to think about how you can incorporate the God, you know, God's word into your daily routines. And I know everyone's life is so different and we all have so many different things going on and lots of variables at play. But if you're able to carve out time in the morning, even just 10 minutes to sit with them and just show them the priority of God's word, the value of seeking him, um, the humility of saying, I need you, God. I'm not rushing off into my day before I seek you because I desperately need you. Um, I just think there's so much value and, and so much that they will take with them, Lord willing, as they get older to see that modeled for them in their parents and you teaching them and showing them just through doing it, how to do it. They don't really know how to do it. And then in encouraging them to engage in prayer, to pray and giving them opportunities to participate in that. Um, that has been really, really sweet and something that I plan to keep on doing with the boys until they're out of the house. So that's what, that's the way we start our day. And then, um, yeah, in God's word. And then throughout the day, something that I heard, 
oh, from a mom a while ago was just in discipleship to be really intentional throughout the day to bring God's word into the conversations, even if it's a good thing, like we're praising God for something, um, you know, like we've been dying for rain here in Texas and we just got a big storm and everybody was like, this is awesome. But up to that point, I had been kind of commenting to the boys like, oh man, I'm praying the Lord will give us rain. And then after the rain pour came, I was like, boys, God answered my prayer. Like, that's so exciting. Like we got rain and I was intentionally trying to, you know, bring it back to the Lord. Like he's our provider. He's the one who even gives us rain. And I know it sounds cheesy and it can feel so like Christianese, but it's just subtle little comments. And it helps all of us remember who our ultimate provider is, who the creator of the world is, who we look to for our resources, who we praise when we get rain. You know, it's not just like, woo, we got rain, but like, thank you Lord for this rain. So little things like that. I try to be intentional. I do not do this perfectly, but I ask the Lord to help me bring to mind things throughout the day that I can give him praise for, that I can bring him into the conversation with. And then when it comes to like problems and sin, (laughs) we do have sin issues throughout the day. I also try to be really intentional. And again, I've seen this modeled in other moms that I greatly admire to bring God's word into those conversations. So for example, when the boys first came, if you're watching this, then you'll be able to see what I'm holding up. There are these sweet, like little laminated verses, very simplified versions of verses that I made. And basically I just created these on my computer. I just found random like little graphics and stuff. They're very cheesy as you can see, but I would do one at a time when the boys first got here as they were learning English, learning the Bible. And as we encountered certain issues or struggles that are very common to us as humans, and especially for brothers, um, I would pull out one of the verses that was applicable to that situation. And instead of just saying like, don't fight with your brother or be nice to your brother, or, you know, don't talk that way to your brother. Just like these kind of commands that aren't attached to any sort of scripture. They're not really targeting the heart. They're just kind of saying, stop that behavior and do something different. I really, really wanted to go after their heart and really help them see their need for Jesus through their sin, that as they're struggling in their sin with one another, as they're struggling with their attitude toward me or struggling to obey or, you know, whatever, like basic things that we go through as adults, but it starts when we're kids, um, wanting to always take it back to God's word to show them, yeah, like when you need Jesus, you're a sinner, like here it is. But two, God's word has beautiful answers for this problem. We don't have to just say, stop doing that. We can actually go to God's word And we can encourage them with God's word. And so I would literally, you know, if one boy was having a big issue with another, I would pull them both aside or pull one of them aside. And I would bring one of these scriptures. So for example, I'm holding it up here. Uh, Philippians 2, 3 through 4, very simplified version says, don't be selfish, be humble, thinking of others more than yourself. So if there was a conflict with their Legos or their Nerf guns or something that they were doing and one brother was genuinely being rude or selfish or not wanting to share, then instead of just saying like, you should share or the nice thing would, you know, the nice thing would be to do this or that, I would sit them down and I would say, hey, let's look at what God says about this. You know, God says, don't be selfish, be humble, thinking of others more than yourself. You know, what could that look like in this situation? And then um, we would pray together and they would see the really beautiful thing about this is so often they would see their sin rather than just seeing their actions and that the reality of their sin through scripture, revealing it would then would then push them toward repentance and push them toward reconciliation. So instead of just brushing it over, like, okay, whatever, they would actually desire to go to their brother, not always, sometimes by my encouragement, but sometimes they would desire on their own to go to their brother and say, hey, I'm sorry for being selfish, or um, I'm sorry for thinking of myself more than you. Will you please forgive me? And from a young age, you're teaching your children how to pursue biblical reconciliation, biblical repentance, biblical... um, yeah, reconciliation is the word of of going to someone that you've sinned against and seeing your sin for what it is and then asking them to forgive you for that sin rather than just like whatever brushing it, you know, brushing it off and moving on, which is oftentimes how kids deal with things. That's how we as parents deal with things, right? Um, another super simple one of verse is Proverbs 15, one simplified version, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So if the boys were having harsh words toward one another, or even a harsh word toward me in that moment, rather than just saying like, don't talk that way, or, you know, don't speak to people that way, like whatever you might, your reaction might be in that moment, or to just be like, whatever, and not even deal with it. Right. Like I've been tempted to do that too, where it's just like, oh, like I'm in the middle of something. That's a lot of work, whatever. 
I know that's not going to be helpful for them in the long term to ignore it or not care about it. So I pause what I'm doing, go over and pull them aside. I try not to have, you know, big confrontations right in front of each other because that can be unhelpful sometimes. Pull the one aside and just say, hey, let's let's look at what Proverbs 15 one says. You know, a gentle answer turns away wrath and try to get to their heart of like, you were having harsh words towards your brother. You weren't loving him. Um, that's not how God wants us to speak to people. Um, here's what Proverbs says, you know, and again, it helps them see not only how they are not walking in the ways of the Lord, but also helping them see what their sin is and helping them to go, oh, okay. And then oftentimes the verses teach you what you should do. Like a gentle answer turns away wrath. Like, did you see how your brother responded to you? He also got angry. A gentle answer would have been so much more effective. Here's how you could say the same thing you said, but in a, with a gentle answer and kind of role-playing. That is another huge thing. We did a lot of role-playing. We still do where the boys, as we're training them and discipling them and teaching them certain things, um, even versus like children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1, teaching them what it looks like to have a gentle answer, what it practically looks like to obey. And so we will, and they think it's a fun game. Like they love it when I say, okay, let's practice what this looks like. Let's role play. They're like, yeah, they think they just like exaggerated and think it's so fun, but it is fun. It also teaches them how to like, it teaches them what it looks like. It puts some meat on the bones of what it looks like to walk in that tr biblical truth that we're talking about. So Role-playing can be really fun um, when you're teaching your children specific truths from God's word and printing out scripture cards. I know mine are really cheesy. Like I said, you can find them. There's all sorts of free ones on Etsy. I mean, not free, but like a couple bucks on Etsy and you can laminate them. Got a laminator on Amazon. Like it's been super helpful. So that is something that I strive to do throughout the day is just bring God's word into conflicts, into joys, into all of those things. And the reason I think that's so important is because we see this in Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9. Um, in the Old Testament, talking about God's laws and God's ways. And you've heard this verse, but it's such a good reminder where it says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Teach them what's them. It's the laws of God, the ways of God. Teach them to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We're obviously not doing all of those things that Deuteronomy talks about, but we are posting them, you know, maybe on the doorposts of our house. I don't think we know if we have the same type of doorposts, but we have scripture around our house. And I keep these verse, these laminated verse cards in an accessible place. We pull them out regularly. Um, the point of that verse is just to say like discipleship isn't a one and done. It's not like a one conversation once a day, move on. It is throughout the day. It's as things arise. It's as you can call attention to God's glory by looking at the magnificent sunset and praising his name. It's, it is the whole day and, and it can feel like, wow, that's a lot, but it, it is, but with God, by God's grace and his help, I think we can become parents who think more in that way, who disciple more consistently, um, and just give God the glory throughout the day in front of our children and teaching them what that looks like. Another thing that we do that we did early on with our boys um, that I have found so helpful is less of a like a spiritual thing, but more of just a practical development thing, helping them grow into young adults. You know, they're young. Caleb's a young man. I mean, he's 13. He's definitely a young man. So one of the things that we do is give them responsibility. And this is something I, again, have seen modeled in so many other godly moms that I really admire. And we give them responsibility throughout within the home, within the family, um, giving them ways that they can, that they can be responsible, that they can take leadership, that they can take part in the family and the home, that it's not a child centered home where the parents do all the work, all the serving, all the thinking, all the decisions. And the kids are just like passive, you know, passive beings just kind of floating along. Like we want the boys to be engaged. We want them to take part in the family, to learn how to have responsibilities, roles, even leadership roles within the family as young men. And so one of the ways, the practical ways that we do this, and I know most of you do this if you have kids, is chores. Um, from the from early on when they came, I made these two laminated chore charts. And it's just, you know, shows Monday through Saturday. We do, we only do a few chores on Sunday, very basic ones, because we love to enjoy that day of rest. Um, but Monday through Saturday, primarily, they have, you know, four or five different chores that have little pictures because early on they, like I said, they couldn't read English. So the pictures would help them know what their jobs were. And y'all, I am telling you, they were 
like any kids, they weren't thrilled at first to see their chore charts. But then as they got into it and got in the rhythm and the routine, and I I really from the beginning tried to phrase the chore charts less of like, here's your chores you have to do, now make it happen. It was more of, hey, being in a family means we all work together for the good of the family. Mom works for the family in this way. You know, dad works for the good of the family in this way. And these chores are ways that you as members of this family can work for the good of our family. These are ways you can take leadership. You can be responsible. You can give back. You can bless our family. You can serve our family. And so, and I have to remind them of that, you know, here and there, just kind of reframing it um, in a positive spin to help them see that as members of a family, we all have different roles and responsibilities. And this, your chores, this is one of those ways that you can bless the family and have responsibilities within the family. And framing it that way, I think really helped them own it a little bit more and and see it not as like, oh, like this negative thing they have to do, but more of, oh, this is the way that I work for the good of our family. These are, they would call it their jobs. Actually, robotas is the name for job in Russian. So they would call it their, their robotas. Like, okay, you know, mama, I gotta go do my robotas. And to this day, we still call it robotas, but it, to them, that's what it was. It was their jobs. It was them going to work in a sense to work for the good of our family. So we do chores on a daily basis. Um, and I think it's so good. You might be wondering, do we give them allowance? Do we pay them? We do not, not for their chores. And the reason is, because like I said, we're a family unit. We all work together for the good of our family, but we do pay them for extra work. So I have a whole bunch of different, you know, extra jobs they can do around our house. It's really cool because my parents live in the same neighborhood. So they'll invite them over, you know, to hang out, whatever. But then sometimes they'll say, hey, we've got some extra jobs if the boys want to come over and make some money. So the boys love that. They can make extra money that way. So we do pay them for work, um, but it's wi- it's work that that is extra. That's not a part of just their daily routine chores that we view as just being a part of the family unit and working for the good of the family. Just as I note on that. <laughs> so yes, daily responsibilities. Um, something else that I love to do with boys, and I've learned a lot from moms who have boys specifically, is to recognize that these are young men. These are not young women. They have to be raised in a way that's a little different than if I were raising girls. And like I said at the beginning, it's so funny and ironic that I have this passion for women and this ministry for women and all these sisters, you know, five girls in my family. And then here I am a mom of these two boys. And I'm trying to learn and will continue to learn how to raise them in a way that's helpful for them to grow into godly men. You know, we're talking like not girl defined here, but guy defined. Like how do I disciple these boys and and help them and encourage them and affirm godly masculine traits within them. Um, How do I do that? I'm growing in that. But some of the things I have found helpful from, like I said, moms who have boys um, just so admire so many of the things that they're doing. It is giving my boys daily opportunities to practice healthy, godly masculinity, being a gentleman, taking leadership. And my husband, Zach, is so good at affirming this in the boys as well and giving them opportunities to be gentlemen, to um, exert their masculinity and in productive ways and to lead, giving them leadership responsibilities within the family. But something that the boys love doing, thanks to my husband, who's really good at this, um, is just such a gentleman, is like opening doors for ladies. Whether it's my door, if we're getting in the car, walking up to the house, um, at a restaurant, my boys are, they, they see the value of treating women like ladies and being a gentleman as we've, you know, we've instilled this in them. We've taught them this and they love it and they thrive on it. So they, they will run ahead of me. You know, if we're walking into Chick-fil-A, they will run ahead of me and they'll open that door. And if they see another lady coming out, they'll hold it for her. And it's just so sweet. And you know, they probably, they're probably thrive off of the attention they get as well. Cause the ladies are just like, Oh, you gentlemen. Wow. We need more of you in this world. You know, like all the comments. So they probably thrive off of the attention as well, but at least they're being affirmed in something good that they're doing. So little things like that, um, just opening doors, gentlemanly actions throughout the day, you know, I'll affirm those kind of things in them and give them opportunities, which by the way, like as a woman, I have to be intentional to not just rush ahead and open the door, but I will like, I'll see they're making, you know, efforts to kind of get ahead of me as we're walking up to something. And I purposely will slow down to give them the opportunity to open the door. Cause I know they want to, and I want to affirm that in them and give them opportunities to practice that. So I have to be mindful of it as well as their mom, but other ways like giving them chances to be in charge of things. Um, every time we leave the house, you know, we turn on our alarm and I've given that responsibility to the boys. So they call them my alarm boys. I'm like, okay, boys, who's got the alarm? And they love it. You know, it's like a keypad. They love typing it in and setting the alarm and 
um, they'll confirm like, okay, mom, alarm set, you know, house is secured. And it's like the cutest thing. They turn into like little security agents, but they love it and they love the responsibility. So I'm always, always looking for tiny little things like that's so, you know, seems so insignificant, but to them, it's a way that they, as young men can take leadership, um, within the home and, and kind of take care of me, even as their mom, like yesterday we were riding bikes. This is the sweetest thing. Side story. We're riding bikes and you know, they're like way out ahead of me. We're like in the neighborhood and they, they say, okay, mom, they kind of yell, like, we're going to head on home. I'm like, okay, I'll see you when we get there. And so they zoom off and I'm still riding my bike, you know, trying to catch up. And suddenly I look up and I see them coming back toward me, you know, like a minute later, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe something happened. I don't know. And they ride up to me and they're like, mom, we, we decided we couldn't leave you. We need to protect you. And I was just like, oh was like the sweetest thing. So then of course they turn into agents in that moment and they start pretending like they're talking and walkie talkies like, okay, I've got her. She's safe. I'll keep an eye. You ride out ahead. You know, and they're like talking back and forth. It is the sweetest thing. But the fact that they even thought about that and rode back, you know, to protect me in the neighborhood was so sweet. And I, I affirmed that I'm like, wow, I am the safest mom out here. Like you guys are protecting me. I am so thankful to have strong sons like you, you know, and I affirm it and I, you know, and I play along with it too. And they just think it's the best. So any chance we can get as moms to affirm godly masculinity, to affirm gentlemanly qualities within our boys, and then step back sometimes and give them an opportunity, um, to take on responsibility, to do those things. I think that is huge. Um, Another thing that we do is give them it along the same line really quick is to give them leadership opportunities um, to practice being independent, doing things apart from me, making all of their decisions. So like, for example, when we go to a restaurant, I've really encouraged the boys to try to order from the menu on their own. So when we walk up, instead of me just saying, okay, what do you want? What do you want? Okay, well, we want all these things. I actually will have them step up and speak to the person if we're sitting at a restaurant to the waiter or at a counter like Chick-fil-A and have them order their portion of the of the food, of the meal. And they love that. At first they were nervous, but now they love it. It's like, okay, they get to be big boys. You know, they get to step up. They get to take the leadership. They get to, you know, make the decision for what they want to eat one. And then two, ordering their own food. And it might seem so insignificant to you. Like that is seems so like nothing, but to them, it's a really big deal. And it's just another little way that I, as their mom can affirm leadership in them and help them make, you know, make decisions on their own and learn how to communicate on their own. And, and they're just thriving in it. They love it. So if you have more tips on things like that, please send them my way. DM me on Instagram at girl Define when this, you know, if you're watching this on there, um, I would love to hear more things that you do as a mom or things you've seen other moms do to affirm leadership, responsibility, independence in our boys. I think it's just so helpful. Okay. Moving right along, um, something else that we've seen modeled again in other families over the years is one-on-one -on -one time with the kids. And I know if you have little kids, this could be really hard, like a baby and a toddler. You're like, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, but just, you know, this is different things for different seasons. But in our season with older boys, it is really important one and really impactful. So we strive to have one-on-one -on -one time every week with the boys, you know, in one capacity, one form or the other, but something that my husband does because that, that dad to son time is so crucially important in boys' lives, like having their dad being involved, discipling them, um, just so crucially important. So I'm thankful for Zach, thankful for his intentional investment in the boys. But something that he does is every Friday, he will take one boy out for a special breakfast, you know, and they just go to like, you know, get tacos or Chick-fil-A or something like that. It's, it's just really simple, but they go out and they'll have like a devotional they're working through or a specific book on a topic, um, or just general discipleship. You know, Zach always asks them, how can I pray for you? You know, he'll get updates on his running list of prayers for them, anything going on in your life that's been hard. He'll ask them how they're doing, how their heart is. If there's any questions they have about anything, it's like a time where they can ask him, any and everything, you know, any question, there's nothing off limits. So just that one-on-one -on -one time to have with their dad. And it is so sweet. And the boys look forward to it all week. They will start counting down the days if it's their week, because he does every other week, you know, one, one week, the other, the next week, they count down the days. This is like their favorite day out of the entire week, this morning to go with Papa, because they still call us Mama, Papa from 
that's how they say it in Russian. And they still call us that. And it is just the sweetest. And I'm like, do not grow out of this, please. It's so cute. So they, they look forward to their morning with Papa and he takes them out and they have their breakfast and Zach gets his coffee. And then they just talk about life. And like I said, sometimes they'll work through a little book. It's a great time to dig into more intentional conversations. For example, our older son, Caleb, he's 13. Like I said, he was 10 when we adopted him. So, you know, from 10, 11, 12, 13, he has been getting discipled on a, you know, one-on-one with Zach regularly. And it's just given them the opportunity to talk about things that would be harder in a family setting on a regular basis. Like Zach will work through these really amazing books on um, topics like sexuality, intimacy, pornography, talking about it at an age appropriate level, you know, as he's grown and just saying like discipling him in in the struggle of sin and lust and sexual sin and talking about pornography and what it is and what happens if you see it or someone tries to show it to you and why it's not, doesn't honor God, why it's not his best for our design and our, our sexuality, like deep conversations like that, or just understanding sex and intimacy. We always want as parents, our relationship with our kids to be an open one where they feel comfortable to come and talk to us about anything that's happening in their lives or any questions they have. We don't ever want them to feel awkward like coming to us to talk about sex or something they saw or something someone showed them. We want them, we want to be the first ones that they come to. And the only way that's going to happen is if they feel comfortable, they feel like it's a safe place. They know that we are not embarrassed about these topics, that we're not shy, that we have had our own struggles as well, being honest with them in an appropriate way, you know, for the things that we've struggled with and helping them to see like, we need God's grace just as much. Like we are striving to honor him in these areas as well, like just like you. And so let's talk about it. Let's have these conversations. So having those one-on-ones gives opportunity for that to just normalize these type of conversations. And so far so good. Like they, they are very open. They are not awkward to talk about anything. Sometimes they'll bring stuff up in the middle of the kitchen and we're all together. And I, I just have to like hold in my laughter because I'm like, we are really talking about this right now, but they have no shame. They have no fear. And I love that about them. There's just like a sense, like an innocence of this is okay to talk about with the family. And I'm all about that. So we will continue to do that. I actually will go out with the boys one-on-one um, less than Zach because I'm with them all the time. So I get, I actually get a lot of one-on-one time with them, a lot of together time with all three of us, but I do get a lot of one-on-one time. And I try to be intentional to take advantage of conversations when it's just one boy and me. Like if we're at a soccer, you know, soccer practice for one and I'm sitting with the other, um, things like that happen all the time with me and the boys. So I can engage in a lot of one-on-ones, but with Zach, he's at work throughout the day. So for him, just that intentional time, a time they can look forward to with their dad, specifically one-on-one, it's just been really, really sweet. So something, if you're at the right stage or season with your kids, um, it's just been a huge blessing to us and to them. Um, okay. I'm going to wrap this up here pretty fast, but Something that my mentor actually told me, and she is a mom of eight kids, all grown now, and um, her kids are just thriving. She has great relationships with them. So I was just asking her, like, how do you, like, how did you do that? How do you still have such great relationships with your kids? And um, clearly they seem to love each other. You seem to have a very, like, joy-filled, intentional family environment. And she, I just said, like, how did you do that when they were growing up? Obviously you have so many. Um, what did that look like? And she said, you know, discipleship is so important. Discipline is so important. Instruction is so important. All of these things are so important. But she said, as moms, I think sometimes we can overemphasize those things to the point that we forget to cultivate a relationship with our children. We focus so much on the investment and the discipleship and the um, instruction that we forget to cultivate just a fun relationship. And she said, I think the relationship is is 50% of the, the outcome of your, of your relationship with your child. She said it way better than that, but basically like, don't, you know, for a lot of parents, it's like instruction, instruction, the do's and don'ts are like 90% of our interactions. And then maybe 10% we have fun and cultivate an actual relationship. She's like, it needs to be 50, 50, 50% instruction, 50% cultivating an intentional relationship. And that really stuck with me for one, but also kind of blew my mind. Cause as I was evaluating my days with the boys, I realized I think I am much more like heavy leaning on the instruction and less on like the let's have fun together, even though I love to have fun. It's just, you know, when you're with your kids, you kind of get in this mode. And so I really took that to heart and I started looking at my days with them and, and looking for opportunities to have fun with them, to be intentional, to play a game with them, to not just wait for them to come to me and say, Hey mom, please can we play this? Or, um, you know, mom, can we do that? But 
to be the one who initiates some of those things that I know they love. Like one thing, uh, they love to play Uno. They are all about Uno. They love spicy Uno that we have like every version of Uno that Walmart sells. <laughs> They're all about it. They don't really ever get tired of it. I get a little tired of Uno every now and then, but they love it. And so I know that it is it's so fun for them if I play with them. So I will initiate it. I will say, Hey boys, let's grab the cards. Let's play, you know, like a break during the school day or, you know, right after we finish school or in the evening, if we're just kind of hanging out, um, I will try to make efforts to initiate and they thrive when I do that. And I end up having a great time, even though, you know, hundredth time we're playing Uno, it's still fun. There's laughter, there's joy, and I'm just investing in the relationship. You know, that's just a simple thing. Or like on the weekends, instead of just like, oh, what should we do? I don't know. I'm tired. I don't want to really do anything. I take them on bike rides. I, I try, you know, I go outside and I play basketball with them. I go out and watch them shoot their their bows. They're really into bow hunting with my husband, Zach. They, they love when I just go watch them, you know, be strong men and shoot their bows. I go out and I'll watch them and encourage them. And wow, look at those muscles and just have fun and affirm them. So trying to, and I'm still growing in this, but looking for opportunities to build my relationship with them, to invest relationally every single day. I know my mentor's advice is true. I know that it will be the thing that that really in the long run, like when they become adults one day, like that's what's going to sustain us is that we have this strong relationship, not just that I was a mom who was intentional with discipleship and instruction, but like really they feel like they were seen, loved, known, cared for. They, I want them to know that I want to be with them, that I want to hang out with them, that I love them and love spending time with them. So that is just one of the last things. Um, Finally, wrapping up kind of our day, I guess I didn't really get into all the details of our day, but many of you know we do homeschool. Like I said, they go four days at home with me. One day on Wednesdays, they go to a co-op. And homeschooling has been a huge challenge for me because it is a big undertaking. I applaud every homeschool mom out there. Woo! It is hard stuff, but it is so rewarding. I love it. And they love it. I'm able to really tailor their curriculum for where they're at in each different category in each subject because coming over from Ukraine, they couldn't speak any English. And so, you know, English, they were both at, you know, like basic kindergarten level, but they, some of, you know, Caleb had had some math. So being able to just tailor their school for their various levels in each subject has been really helpful. It has helped them thrive in school. They love it. They love doing school with me. Um, so it's just been, it's where we're at. It's, you know, we prayed a lot about all the options and that's where the Lord landed us. That's, that's what we felt the most piece about it made the most sense for their situation. Um, and I've just been, I've been growing in my role as homeschool mom, but I love it. And as far as I know, we're going to keep doing it. We'll see what the Lord has for the future. But for now, that's where we're at. So wrapping everything up with a pretty bow, we always end our nights with the way we started it. So we start with prayer, we end with prayer and the boys have a bedtime routine that they follow. Again, I have a laminated chart. If you haven't, maybe caught on. I really like laminated charts, <laughs> mainly for the purpose of just providing clarity um, for all of us. I just, you know, uh, I just love those laminated charts. So I have another laminated chart that has, it says bedtime routine on the top, and then it has six things that they need to do to get ready for bed. This is a new thing we implemented because we found ourselves, like many of you, chasing our kids at night when it came to bedtime and finding ourselves frustrated, even angry, like, okay, why aren't they listening? Like, okay, boys, brush your teeth. Okay. Clean up your room. Okay. Uh, grab your water. You know, all the things that are like the same things we do every night. It just felt like we were constantly having to chase them and remind them and they would get frustrated. We would get frustrated. And I just thought this is not like a joyful routine at night. We got to change this. So instead of us having to always be the ones to chase them, I thought, you know, these boys are getting bigger and they can handle responsibility. Again, another opportunity for them to step into responsibility. I put it all on them. I listed the six things and I said, okay, boys, here's the challenge. Every night you're responsible for your bedtime routine. You have to accomplish all six things in less than 10 minutes. I mean, they're like basic things like straighten your room, brush your teeth. They do it in like three minutes, but I gave them 10 minutes to get all six things done. You know, go potty, floss, grab your water, get in bed. And I put it on them and I said, you know, if you get in bed in less than 10 minutes doing all six things, then here's your reward. You get to stay up a little extra and read in bed, you know, grab some books, have some fun. If you don't, then there will be a consequence. You will lose the privilege of playing with some of your toys the next day for them. They're really into Lego. So like, okay, if you can't handle this responsibility, then you will lose this privilege tomorrow. Um, so really putting like, again, that responsibility on them to take ownership, to 
step it up you know, and to start behaving more like a, like an independent adult, like I'm responsible for myself. I've got to make these things happen. So we implemented that. And I am telling you, it was a night and day difference. Our bedtime routine became a joyful, thriving time. And they love the challenge. I am telling you, they thrive on the challenge. When I say, okay, boys, please start your bedtime routine. They run around, they get excited. They, okay, I'll grab the waters, you know, like, okay, I'll start cleaning the room. You brush your teeth. They work as a team to like accomplish everything. And then they get in bed and they yell, you know, mom, dad, and we come in and do our, you know, the prayer and stuff like that. But it's just been really cool to see. Wow. You know, once you, if you just put the responsibility and the leadership on them and you equip them with what they need to accomplish that, and then you praise them and reward them when they do, it is amazing the difference it can make. So just a little idea there for you. If you've been struggling and your kids are a little older and you feel like this is something they could handle, then I encourage you get a laminator. (laughs) So once they're in bed, Zach and I come in, we pray, and then we sing Amazing Grace, which is one of my favorite hymns. We have been singing this to them since day one. When we were in Ukraine, the very first day that they came with us, and we became a family of four, and we put them to bed that night as their parents, the very first day, we prayed with them, and we sang Amazing Grace, and we have done it every single night since, and it is something that they love. They sing along with us now. We are all over the place as far as keys. We are all in a different key, but it is a joyful noise to the Lord (laughs) and they love it. And I think for them, it's just, it's such a routine and something that just like, oh, they've had since they first got here. It's, it's what bedtime means. It means we get in bed and we sing amazing grace and it just kind of winds them down, calms them down, um, and just kind of prepares them for sleeping. So that's just like a sweet way that we end the evening every night. Um, so Yeah. There it is. There's so much more I could say, but I all in, like I have loved being a mom. I prayed for it for so many years, desired it for so long, faced so many disappointments and uh, just things not working out the way that I hoped they would. And then when God blessed me with these two boys, it it has been the sweetest gift. And I, I love being a mom. Like I genuinely love it. I look forward to time with my boys. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean I'm always like, chipper and thriving and just like, woohoo, like I have hard days and I have times where I feel stressed and I've got to like, oh, like this is so hard. And I take it to the Lord. I try to remember to do that. You know, I'll debrief with Zach at the end of the day. Like, oh, you know, if there's conflict or, you know, the boy, they're boys, like they're kids. They're going to push against my leadership, my authority sometimes like navigating that. And I'll run things by Zach. Like, Hey, how could I have handled that better? What do you think? Like, here's what I did, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, like I still have a lot of growth and not every moment is butterflies and rainbows, but for the most part, like I am so thankful for this gift of these boys and I am so blessed to get to be their mom. I do view it as a huge privilege and a huge responsibility. So I just want to encourage you if you're a mom, if you're in that season of motherhood, to really lean in to the Lord, to seek him, um, to recognize that like as moms, we need God's grace. We need his strength to get through every day. And if you're in a season with littles, I know as I've talked to my own sister, Bethany, with her little baby and Davey, who's a toddler and other friends that I have, like I know that season where you're sleep deprived and it's all hands on deck and the kids are young. There's not much they can really give back or you can't like go ride bikes together. I know that has its own unique challenges. So again, for all of us though, going to the Lord, seeking him, finding pockets of time where we can spend with the Lord and just say, God, I need you. Please help me. Um, getting, setting our hearts on him. That is the fuel that we need to be godly moms for our children, sons and daughters to raise them in the Lord, to even be reminded of bringing the Lord up throughout the day. It's not going to happen if we ourselves aren't soaking in the word, um, in one form or another. So I just encourage you to be a woman of the word yourself, and that will naturally overflow into how you raise your children. So I hope this conversation was fun. Again, it was so down to earth, maybe maybe encouraging. I don't know, but that's kind of what motherhood looks like for me right now, just in a nutshell. And I can't wait to see what it's going to look like over the next few years. My son, Caleb, reminds me regularly that he's going to start driving in two years when he's 15 and can get his permit. And I my mouth just hits the floor every time because I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I just became a mom. What? You're, you're like talking about driving, but of course he's looking forward into the future. So the next few years are going to be fun and exciting and challenging in all sorts of new ways. Um, but I am just thankful to God for each and every day. 
All right, guys, come hang out with me over on Instagram at Girl Defined. I would love to hear from you. Any other tips, advice, um, nuggets of wisdom that you've received in your mothering, your motherhood journey, come share those with me. And then if you're single and you're still listening, girl, you rock. This conversation I know isn't applicable to where you're at right now in life, but I'm so glad you stayed for the ride that you came along and enjoyed the conversation. And one day, if God has motherhood in his plans for your future, then maybe some of the things I shared could become applicable to you then. Who knows? Only God knows. All right. I love you guys. Can't wait to chat with y'all next time.